Oh, there it goes. Okay, while the worship team is getting out here this morning, we're going to be singing beforehand a song that you are going to be singing with us through the, in the service, okay? So listen, it's easy tune, really easy, and we had to learn it, so it hasn't been that hard because we missed a fair few practices there in February. But anyway, we're going to do it right now, and then we're going to start the service, okay? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Port Elgin United Church on this Time Change Sunday. It's nice to see all of you here. I really thought it would just be me and Nancy and a few of the worship team, and nice to have you all here. Welcome to our online viewers. We're happy to have you here as well. And uh, for those of you who slept in today, this is your only option. So uh, we're uh, happy that you've chosen to join us online as well. I'm Reverend John Smith, and it is the third Sunday of Lent, uh, March the 12th, 2023. Hard to believe we are here. Um, if you are collecting items for the food basket, which is our Lenten uh, program this year, uh, the uh, items are being collected at the front this time. So if you brought some uh, with you, you can bring them up here. They go to the food basket every week. So uh, we start fresh with a, a new box each week. And thank you already, so many of you, for taking part in that collection. Um, if you're like me and you get to the grocery store and you've forgotten your little squares of paper, you could also do a cash donation, right? So uh, if, you, if you wanted to, at the end of Lent, you could add it all up and, and make a, a cash donation. I have a feeling that's going to be me this year. After church today, we're having a celebration. We're going to celebrate the wonderful work and the ministry of our church administrator, Kathleen Wolf. And uh, so everyone's invited uh, to come to that after church. We're going to fet her with our, our best congratulations as she moves on to a new position and uh, still working with the United Church. Um, but uh, Kathleen, uh, we're sorry to see you go, but we know that it is exactly what you need to do. So uh, after church. Next Sunday, uh, <clears throat> we're having food before church and food after church. 
So uh, if you wanted to go to the men's breakfast at the Sunrise Cafe, uh, that's at 8 o'clock at the Colonial Motel. Um, I understand they serve four C's. Caffeine, camaraderie, cholesterol, and calories. <laughs> So uh, if you're interested in that. And then after church, we're having a, a lunch for uh, the whole congregation. We're actually having a baptism next Sunday. And the family who are uh, bringing their child for baptism wanted to have a lunch with all of you. So everyone's invited to stay for that uh, next Sunday. Uh, in our worship today, Nancy Klein and the worship team, thank you so very much for all your efforts. I keep throwing new stuff at them, and they keep saying, okay, we'll learn that. So that could rub off a little bit on you, right? So uh, you could go, okay, we'll learn that. Um, that would be great. Um, in our booth today, George Brown and John DeYoung, thank you very much. And June Van Bastelar is reading our scripture. So let's begin our worship. We're starting with our refrain at the beginning. And then we're moving right into come, now is the time to worship.
our call to worship. O come, let us sing to the Most High, the creator of the cosmos. Let us make joyful music for the beloved one. Let us come to the Most High with hearts of thanksgiving. With gratitude, let us offer songs of praise. For the creator is infinite. His love is forever. The creator breathes life-giving breath in us in every moment. The beloved one is supreme, our friend and our companion along life's way. Oh, that today we might hear love's voice, that we might open our hardened hearts and return to the love of our supreme God. We pray that we might hear God's voice and welcome love's seed into our very being. For life flows into us and from us out into the world. All of life is a dance with the Most High. All of life, including our worship, is an opportunity to dance with love and be awakened by love's spirit alive in us. May it be so. Amen. And now let's join in our opening prayer. In our hearts, the soil is ready. In our souls, the seed is waiting. In our minds, there is a new bud waiting for the moment of warmth and grace. In our hearts, the water of life in our souls, the warmth of compassion. In our minds, a flower breathes. How beautiful is this day. And our hymn is Deep in Our Hearts. Well, good morning, everyone. It is third Sunday of Lent. We've been reading through the stories in the Gospel of John, and today we're going to read the story about a Samaritan woman who uh, comes to the well of Jacob. And at the well of Jacob, she has a conversation with Jesus, and uh, Jesus says, uh, I am living water. I'm going to give you the living water, and uh, we'll hear all of that in just a moment. So I was thinking about the living water. <clears throat> And I'm going to need my spouse to come and help me for a second. <laughs> so this is a very simple exercise, but you'll get the point, I think. So this glass is full, right? Yeah. Right to the top. So just walk along toward me and just kind of bump me. Just go back there a bit and walk along. You can see we didn't practice this. <laughs> oh! 
That was a big bump. <laughs> you can go sit down now. <laughs> Some people just love an audience, right? <laughs> so, uh, whatever we're full of gets bumped out, right? So, if we're full of joy and our day comes along and bumps into us, joy overflows, right? If we're full of negativity and our day comes along and bumps into us, guess what comes out? Negativity, right? So uh, it's, this is an easy thing to teach children, right? If, uh, if we're full of kindness and our day comes along and bumps into us, guess what comes out? Kindness, kindness right? So the values that we hold within us, if we focus on them, they grow within us, and then they become really who we are in the world, whether it's good times or difficult times, right? So I was thinking about this living water and thinking, gosh, you know, uh, a church is full of living water, right? Or the individual members are full of, of living water. And so when, when things come along and bump into us or are a little bit difficult for us, what comes out, right? Living water, right? We're going to be okay, right? We're full of life. God loves us. We're going to give that gift back to the world no matter what, right? No matter what, no matter what happens. So let's bear that in mind today as we think about living water. from John chapter 4, verses 4 to 26. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Jesus responded, If you recognize God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go get your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You've had five husbands, and the man you are now with isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. The woman said, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, 
Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. This is the word of the Lord. very much. Well, I wonder how many of us remember the national inquiry from 2019 into the plight of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Do you remember that they did in fact finish their work, they did complete the inquiry and published a report entitled Reclaiming Power and Place and then made 231 recommendations towards social justice for Indigenous women in our country and I ask you, what came of those? 
They call the systemic mistreatment of indigenous women and girls a genocide. Perhaps you remember that. As the numbers of unsolved cases began to mount. It's really hard to forget that one most famous case, the perpetrator whose name I will not mention, who was a pig farmer in British Columbia, who trolled the streets of downtown Vancouver, picking up indigenous women and disposing of them on his property. So I was thinking about all of this on International Women's Day a few days ago, a day to celebrate women and their accomplishments. It's sad and ironic, isn't it, that we have to set a day apart for that. But it occurs to me that we are the richer for it because at least that one day a year, the stories of women, both the successful ones and the horrific ones, are remembered and told. The UN, the president of the UN reminded us that with the aggressive anti-woman policies of many countries in the world, and that's today, not yesterday, today, what with the poisoning of schoolgirls in Iran and the blatant disregard for women in places like Afghanistan and many others, as you know, they stated gravely that it will be another 300 years before the world comes close to gender equality. So I heard that number and I was offended by it. I've worked alongside some fabulous women. Most of the women in my life are part of what would be called the second wave feminist movement many of whom have been career trailblazers, outstanding people in their fields. A friend of ours is a leading expert, perhaps the country's top expert in gender-based violence. I can only imagine what she was thinking when she heard the president of the UN saying it would take another 300 years. I hope she was as offended as we all should be. Of course, the hatred and fear of women goes back eons. I've preached about this before. Anyone who has given birth, I'm sure, can tell you that women have an incredible amount of power, right? Not only can they bring the babies into the world, but they also can shape children's lives and values. So it's not a surprise, is it, that men want to control that power? That's a lot of power. And it's not a surprise that many states in the USA, just since last fall, the defeat of Roe v. Wade, have moved to seriously restrict access to abortion because men in power are very afraid of women in power. As you know, and I have said this many times in the course of my career, I've been tired of saying it, the ideal woman for many in a lot of the main religions of our day, and I'm talking about today, not yesterday, is that of a chaste virgin, a sexualized icon of male desire to be kept indoors. In our time, as huge swaths of people have given up on organized religion, we're starting to see the pendulum swing, perhaps to a more balanced view. One can only hope. So, I mention all of this as backdrop to our scriptures today because from the Gospel of John, we have this incredible story of a woman who speaks back to Jesus. Written maybe a hundred years after Jesus was gone from the earth, it is an astounding story of a woman from Samaria who had come to Jacob's well for water in the heat of the day. And even as this is such a familiar tale, we must remember that it is a tale full of male stereotypes, small and large nods to the prevailing misogyny of the day. So, for starters, as is most often the case in the Gospels, the, women has no, the woman has no name, right? There, she isn't given a name, the dignity of a name. Like the hundreds of indigenous women discussed in the murdered, missing and murdered indigenous women report, many of the, those women also could not be dignified with a name. Or like the thousands of women who suffered sexual violence just in the last year, the raping of young women and girls in places like Myanmar 
as well as in the captured villages of Ukraine. These women do not have names and may forever be unknown to us. What else? There's that whole conversation about having had five husbands and now she's living with a man, right? So we get the inference, right? She's sexually improper. Now, there are actually quite a few scripture stories about the sexual improprieties of women. Not so many about men, although there are a few. And the most egregious example being the idea that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Most of us think that, but it's simply not true. It is not in the Bible at all. Mary of Magdala was a wealthy woman and a benefactress of Jesus' ministry. There's no evidence to suggest that she married Jesus or bore him a child, which became the holy grail of a Dan Brown novel. Right? You all read Dan Brown more than you read the Bible. It's easy, though, to imagine stories like this when it comes to the women of the Bible because we have been well trained. Now, Samaria. Samaria was the remnant of the old northern kingdom of Israel. What is that, anyway? After the death of King Solomon, 800 years before Jesus, the 12 tribes of Israel fought with one another, and the 10 northern tribes formed what they called the northern kingdom, and the two southern tribes uh, formed what they called the southern kingdom, right? Kind of makes sense, north, south. Um, <clears throat> the 10 northern tribes wanted to distance themselves from the two southern tribes, so they established their own holy temple in a place called Samara, in Samaria. And they set up their own holy temple and their own Jewish system there to count as a counterpoint to that which was already in Jerusalem. However, the Syrian armies came in and destroyed their whole country in 722 BC. The 10 tribes were killed or sent off to be slaves in other lands. A few were allowed to remain and they were allowed to, re, uh, to intermarry with invading armies. Guess what? That happened five times. So in that gospel story when Jesus says, Oh, Madam Samaria, you have lived with You've had five other husbands. He's talking about Samaria, right? Samaria has had these other relationships. Bottom line, this no-name woman at the well was an outsider to Jesus. His kingdom would not be available to her or her people. Those old prejudices and hatreds ran deep. Here's another interesting thing. Jesus asked her for a drink, right? Can I have a drink, please? Guess what? In the Old Testament, that's code language for, I'm interested in you as a woman, I would like to marry you. <laughs> I kid you not, Genesis 29, when Jacob goes looking for a woman, he goes to the well, and at the well, he asks all these women for a drink, right? So it's code language. Offering the drink to him would be a sign from the woman that says, yes, I'm available, choose me. This is so sexist that even my eight-year-old grandson would see right through it, right? <laughs> Over the centuries, though, as male pastors have expounded on this story, interpreting it for their congregations, a lot has been made about the woman's sexual past, her sinfulness, shame, and humiliation. Everyone wants to judge her, hate her, dehumanize her, therefore to keep her nameless and powerless. And that, my friends, is missing the point entirely. Right? That is not what this scripture is about. Back in 2015, I was working like a, a demon on my doctoral thesis on the reconstruction of Christianity in Canada in the post-postmodern era. 
And I had made it a particular aspect of my doctoral work that I was only using Canadian source material for my thesis, which made it really difficult because there are very few Canadian theologians, actually, who've even published work. In particular, though, I chose a book called A Complicated Kindness, written by Miriam Taves, who's up for an Academy Award tonight, by the way, for Women Talking. This is who I'm talking about. And I chose it as a source document because in that novel about a small Mennonite town in southern Manitoba, the decline of religious extremism was documented along with the impacts of harsh, restrictive religious practices on the family living there. Most importantly, their two young girls, uh, Tash and Nomi. The novel sweeps across the full landscape of misogyny in Canadian religion. The preacher man in the novel named the mouth because of his moralistic sermons. I was a little offended by that. <laughs> the lack of any kind of sexual education for the town's young people, both boys and girls. And the morality police who attack the women, not the men. And so uh, leave, leaving every single character in the story, including the men, as victims. So here's the thing. I go to Chicago, I sit down with my thesis team, and they said, you cannot use that novel as source material for your thesis. First, it's not biblical. Second, it wasn't written by an academic with appropriate degrees and CV. And third, it offers only one voice to the conversation, the voice of a young, uneducated girl. They questioned the validity of her voice. This is in 2015, Chicago, Illinois, at one of the leading seminaries of the day. So we can't listen to the voice of a young, uneducated girl. There's something wrong about this picture? The woman at the well, you see, is exactly the same. She's not of the preferred tribe. She has, can have no designs on entering the kingdom that Jesus describes. She has no credentials whatsoever. She has a checkered past. She has no education. And her voice is a lone voice, the voice of the marginalized, dispossessed, the voice of the shut out, a voice that in ordinary daily life in first century Palestine would not be heard. And that's why she comes to the well in the middle of the day when no one else is there. And here is the genius of the Gospel of John, and it is why I still like this most chastised Gospel about Jesus, because here the woman speaks. In fact, of all the conversations Jesus is recorded to have had across the four Gospels, this is the longest single conversation he has with anyone at all. She's assertive. She questions his motives in asking for that drink. She knew what the gesture, gesture symbolized, but she defended herself. And she's kind. She offers the drink anyway. And here we have quite the scene, isn't it? She offering a living cup of water to the, to the one who would offer her the living water, right? First, she offers that to him first. She discusses religion and the awkward possibility of a Jew and a Samaritan sharing anything other than mutual distrust. She's open and welcoming, and she invites him to stay in her village for a few days, which he does. And Jesus, for his part, he sits down beside her. He doesn't judge her. Can you imagine him doing that to you, sitting down beside you? No judgment. He speaks of life-giving water and doesn't hoard it from her. Instead, he offers it to her. He sees her as just as worthy as those 12 dusty men he called his disciples. Can you imagine him offering it to you? the water of life. And then another point, 
we get. There's a direct contrast to last week's story of Nicodemus who came to Jesus in the middle of the night for fear of being discovered and who, it seems, stole away again in the night without actually responding to Jesus and the spiritual assertions that we talked about last week, which kind of seems rude if you think about it. The unnamed woman here, so easy to judge and dismiss, she gets it. She gets it. Right at the end of that passage that June read, you're the Messiah. He says, I am. Right? That's the first time that conversation happens. She runs back to her village to tell others about it. She's strong. She's invincible. She roars. Right? That's how first wave feminists came along. I love that he offers her living water. It's another analogy. And so we find as we read through these gospel stories in the book of John that there's all these different ways of kind of talking about the same thing, right? Different analogies and different pictures for talking about that great spiritual secret that's going to be revealed when Jesus dies on the cross, right? That's why we're reading this in Lent. Right? This is all a build-up to the events of uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. But the, that great secret being that we are all spiritual beings having a physical experience. Remember I asked you that last week, if, if you understood that, that we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, not physical beings having a spiritual experience? Because two elements combine, hydrogen and oxygen, both of which are invisible gases, and they come together in such a way as to make life possible. They come together in our flesh. It's just another analogy. Living water, hydrogen, oxygen, invisible gases, encased in flesh, right? Spirit. In offering this gift of insight and understanding to the Samaritan woman, Jesus reaches across all the, all the divides, all the prejudices, all the racism, all the classism, all the isms, and he sees the sacred secret in her as well. She's a spiritual being. So in those days, well, maybe in ours, our day too, that's an amazing thing. Right? For a man to see in a woman a spiritual being. It's astounding. Jesus is so clear here in this story. To be human is to see the sacred in every single being. I think Gandhi was right when he said that he could not know peace until his neighbor was at peace. He said, I can't know joy until my neighbor lives in joy. I can't know security unless my neighbor is secure. I wonder if he might have added that we cannot fully name ourselves as sacred until all people are named as sacred. Astute readers of the Bible might note that after this conversation with the Samaritan at the well, we never hear from her again. I've often wondered, though, as I imagine it, that this particular con conversation in which Christ names her as a sacred vessel of holding the water of life, I wonder if that was like the turning point in her life. And what happened to her? Wouldn't you like to know? Right? It's the gospel that was never written. What happened to these people after they encountered Jesus? But we can know what it feels like to let Christ name us as sacred vessels of living water. And therefore, the unnamed woman's legacy can live on our actions of love and compassion 
right? When we offer living water to the unnamed, no-named, missing, forgotten, discouraged, downtrodden, and so on. Because we are the living body of Christ, and we're called to name the sacred in every single being. Amen. time for us to receive the offering, let's come together in our offering prayer. God of love, as in Jesus Christ, you shared your love with us, so may we share your love with others. May the gifts that we bring to this place, our time, our energy, our money, our love, all reflect the message of your deep abiding love for all. As we walk this Lenten journey through the wilderness around us, May these gifts give us hope. May these gifts bring us strength. May these gifts inspire us to acts of sacrificial love. Amen. And our hymn is grateful. Time for
for our prayer, so let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to grow and to change. Thank you for planting the seeds of the future deep within us. Thank you for providing living water to nourish those seeds. Thank you for letting me grow at my own pace and for teaching me patience when I grow too slowly. Gracious God, thank you for giving us this time of Lent, for the opportunity to search deep inside and find the wonder and grace you have stored for us there. Help us to see the sacred wonder of each thing and in each person we meet, in those we love, and in those we have trouble loving. Gracious God, pour out your living water upon this congregation. Help us to claim our purpose, to hold on to your love when things get tough, to care for one another as family. Give us the courage to stay open and affirming. Give us the will to accept others as they are and the courage to let go of our own needs and projections. In our prayers, let us remember those who are at home perhaps alone or isolated. Let us remember those recovering from illness. We ask for a blessing for Dorothy Cameron today. We remember our young parents and their kids during this March break time. May they find joy and kindness and grace again in these days. We give thanks for Kathleen, for all the dedication and love she has showered upon this place. We pray a blessing on her. We give thanks for those who have volunteered to be on our search team, on our council, on all who work for the mission and outreach of this place. We remember that we are, each of us and together, the body of Christ in this world. Now let us bring our hearts and minds together in the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now, our last hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
do sing. <laughs> May we go from this place today with our hearts full of praises and let us go as the sacred vessels of Christ's love that we are and let us pour out that love upon this world so in need of what we have to give. Amen. <laughs>